My name is Madhur and I'm speaking from India and um, this is actually the season where we get a lot of flowers and a lot of butterflies. For whom else is this season for uh, butterflies going on right now? Can they raise their hands? Yes? Okay. So yeah, but I am at the moment, there are many little flies, but not much butter. <laughs> <laughs> flies, flies are tiny, tiny little thing. They are everywhere. <laughs> Missing yes. the I, I really like the title for this talk, Butterfly Talks. And I think butterflies are very beautiful. Um, and I like butter a lot. So um, I like both butter and butterflies. And... Uh, Butterflies serve a very important role in the ecosystem as they move from each flower to different flowers and they cross pollinate and make the whole ecosystem grow. And, uh, but research is also telling us that since many decades, their population has also been declining. And uh, like butterflies, we have many other traditions and cultures and folklores and languages which are also slowly receding. So in these talks, we will uh, listen to some people who are engaging in very exciting projects and trying to enliven, reconnect and re-engage with uh, through acts in education. And these projects are done individually, but they are also part of this whole larger movement and they have their own impacts and uh, and they also affect far beyond their local regions. So these talks are organized to connect and share and spread these butterflies effect uh, wider into the system. Uh, the title for this panel is Educating the Whole Being, Body, Mind and Soul. Uh, we have four panelists on this. Lanise Heron, Frederick Labarth, Mogowe Walter and myself Madhur. So each of the panelists will have around 10 minutes to share about their uh, project, the vision which, is, which keeps them awake uh, and which they keep working for. Then we'll have around 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. So whatever questions you have, please save them for the Q&A in the end. Uh, you're also welcome to type in your questions and I'll read out. So uh, first we'll hear from Lenise. Nice is a motivational speaker and an experienced coaching professional. And by providing clients with the apt tools, knowledge, she helps them to unleash their potential and become more successful in personal and professional lives. So Lanise, we'll hear from you about the journey to self-love. Over to you. Thank you so much. I want to say your name correctly, Madur. Is that right? My door? Yes. Awesome. So thank you for such a lovely introduction. Yes, I am a transformational self-love coach and I actually choose to work with women um, because that is just my passion. And over the years, I, myself, so what I'm going to do is just share a piece of my journey and how I got here and why I think it's, why I think it's so important to focus on self-love and growth. So my first interaction with self-love was a Beyonce song, or self was a Beyonce song, Me, Myself, and I. And I thought that that was the epitome of learning who you are. And instead of, what I, from what I know now, I know that was self-preservation. I didn't open myself up to anyone. I, uh, I was very closed off and it caused a lot of trauma to be trapped inside. So, in college, when I got asked to do this, this talk, I said, how could I tie this into higher education? So in college, I had a couple of drunk nights. I can't speak for everybody else. I've had a couple of drunk nights where I made some really questionable decisions, um, but I'm here to talk about them. I had friends who made some very questionable decisions that led to untimely deaths, untimely pregnancies for them, um, and just 
took them so far from the place that they declared and intended to be at the beginning of the, sem of the semester. And I sat there and thought, what if there was a prerequisite to learn yourself, to look at yourself and understand why it is you make these decisions? What has framed your way of being, of thinking? Why is it that, um, for me personally, why is it that I was seeking so much outside of myself? What if that was taught to me before I went on this journey of being in college and, and, and getting into all of these things? Um, and, and that's what I wanna bring to this space. If a class was offered or something was offered on self-discovery or self-love, if we had the opportunity to go deeper, what would that mean for my, not only for my friends who are now dealing with what they're dealing with now, but for the people who are going through it in this very, very moment, the people who are actually in a place that could use these tools to help shape, right? We're always gonna, we're gonna be able to experience life in our own way, but what if we had the tools and knew how to mm, see ourselves from a place of wholeness and completeness in which we were created? So that is what I get to do on the other end with women who have already, who would testify right now and test and give a testimony to saying that they lost themselves well before they came to me, well before they went to college, well before they got married and had kids, that it started somewhere where they were very small, so if we could meet them somewhere, somewhere where they are before they can get to me, I love my job and I don't wanna lose it. I love coaching women. However, if we could meet them before they got there to teach them and give them the tools that could stop, not stop, but help them to not look for validation. This goes for men and women. Validation, acceptance outside of themselves. What would that mean? What would that look? look like a part of me, everything in their own way that's going to help them become who they are is there's some things that I wish I didn't have to go through and if I would have known better if someone would have shown me at least another way that would open up the opportunity to grow or experience life with more confidence with more awareness and that is what I hope to continue to bring to this world Right now, I work with women. My goal, my dream, is to have a center for, for little girls to start young before they even get to higher education so that they already know, have a really strong sense of who they are as they choose their, their uh, careers, their goals, their whatever it is. They will, go, they will come from a position of knowing themselves, loving themselves confident in the ability to make mistakes, confident in the ability to, to show up, messy, happy, as they are, just as they are. That is my whole purpose for doing the work that I do. And I hope, I don't even know where I'm at on time. You didn't give me eight minutes, my daughter. I must be doing good. I must be speaking fast because <laughs> you haven't even given me the eight minutes yet. So I wrote down a couple of things. I don't have all of the answers right? This is just my uh, area that I am focused on, but I know there's so much more. And I know that if we come together with our different experiences, with our different expertise, with our different modalities, how can we impact in our different cultures, right? I'm talking about Beyonce, yeah, I might be talking about somebody else, right? So how can we reach and teach self-love in our different cultures in a way that it's going to be so impactful that it transcends generations. I don't have the answers for everyone. I, I only know what I know, but together, together, any and everything is possible. So I can't wait to hear everyone else's shares and their passions because I know that while I do this work over here in my little area and you guys are doing your work over in your area, all together, we're making such a huge, huge difference. And that is all I, that's it, my daughter. I don't need any more time. I don't need not one more minute. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lenise, for that very motivational energy that you carry. Um, next up, we have Frederick, who 
I've met many years ago and uh, he, I can just say he radiates wherever he comes. And so he's a freelance mentor, healer and teacher, a living heart and an almost missionary faith in the power that we all have to heal, love, empower and grow ourselves for good. Frederick, over to you. And uh, you will be sharing on inner focusing. Thank you, Madhur. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lanis. Yes, for that beautiful opening. Yeah. <laughs> it's the the slogan I've put on the main, on the first page of my website is this. You know, the world needs you as you are, not as you think or have been told you should be. <laughs> because uh, that's definitely also what I see is that. You know, human beings are fantastic by nature, but we twist them so much. We, there's so much uh, twisting of the mind and twisting of the... <laughs> that we end up with violence, we end up with people who become ego-centered when they just want to blossom, they just want to give. And, uh, and it's been my journey. I... Self-love also has been the journey because it's, uh, it's definitely the, the rooting of every, every other good stuff that comes from the human heart and from the human soul. It, it's rooted in self-love, and, uh, and it's a journey, self-love. It's, uh, it's, uh, I'm working as a coach also since a few years, and so I see, I see many people looking at self-love in terms of good food, good clothes, good makeup, good, no, good life. <laughs> but uh, to me, the journey of self-love has been a journey of, uh, of acceptance of every bit of myself, including the... No, I, I don't say the name because I want to remain polite, but including the shadows, the, the, very, the very dark side of myself also. And to see in that, that uh, behind that thing that we call darkness, that we call, uh, there is something extraordinarily beautiful that also wants to come to life, but that has, that has been hurt, that has been repressed, that has been oppressed, and therefore has turned into an energy that is really disturbing us. And, uh, and uh, so my journey is, is a bit of a very, it's a very unconventional journey because I, I dropped from mainstream, I was 18 years old. I grew up in Africa and uh, all my time in Africa I was told, you know, when, <laughs> when you are 18 you'll go back to France and you will meet civilization. And the day I came back to France at 18 to meet civilization, I looked at it and said, you call that civilization? No way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I see a machine, I see a big machine. Where is life? Where is the warmth? Where is the, the vibrance? And so I dropped and I didn't know what I was going to find. I had no clue that there were alternatives. I knew absolutely nothing. Went into all kind of trouble, like young people do, of course. <laughs> and uh, 27 years old, I had a massive spiritual experience that fell from the sky. And, uh, and then I embarked on a very, very strong uh, path of spiritual discipline, Raj Yoga. And I lived 10 years as a monk, then I was sent as a monk, in inverted comma, not the, not the, not the formal monks, so as a very busy monkhood. <laughs> we were running a retreat center in the UK, in, in, in the Oxford area, very busy and really a life of 3.30 uh, in the morning up, 10.30, 11 at night sleeping, and non-stop in the middle, 20 minutes rest. <laughs> including service, meditation, study, etc. And that was a fantastic training for me. And, uh, and then I ended up in Vietnam to open a meditation center. And that's where I really pushed my, my exploration into all the dimensions of the being. Because I had realized that uh, Raj Yoga had only given me mental tools like concentration, focus, determination, positive thinking. And I had no, no awareness of the heart. I was a loving person, I was a good person, <laughs> but <laughs> the heart is another story, you know, and that's where the shadows are sitting, that's where the pain is sitting, that's where I'm... And so after 20 years of, uh, of celibacy, because that's one of the, the conditions of, uh, of monkhood, I ended up in, uh, I opened a relationship and, uh, with a woman, and that's where the whole thing of the heart just blasted open, and it was magnificent, but it was like the the most terrible period of my life because all the pain came out. And uh, I, was, uh, I was 45 at the time, I was uh, 
47, almost 50, <laughs> I was supposed to be the, the big guy opening a new meditation center in Hanoi. I ended up like a, a five years old boy lost <laughs> and a 16 years old adolescent jealous and anxious and completely panicked at life. <laughs> And so that really threw me into the world of the heart, where I where finally I discovered self-love. Because as long as our heart has not, uh, has not been touched and opened properly and accepted properly, then self-love is, uh, is incomplete. And uh, so that's the journey. I mean, it's a, it's a long journey. And what I do in terms of my work, uh, I, I, share, uh, I share my journey because I'm, uh, I'm completely uneducated. <laughs> And uh, the only education I have is my own experience. Eh? The, the 10 years I spent as a monk, we had no books, no internet, we had access to nothing. Only core teachings and practice and service. And it was frustrating in some ways, but it was fantastic in other ways because there's no distraction. You, know, you dig in, you dig in, you dig in, you dig in, and you have only yourself to, to read. <laughs> Only your own mind, your own story, your own relationship. So I started to observe. I started to, you know, to pick up any little thing that could help me build my understanding. And, and that's how I learned. And then when I was in Vietnam, I learned from uh, being in a position of teaching, so-called. And, uh, and when you teach, you discover so much also. You learn so much. So I'm, uh, inner focusing is a... Uh, it's really looking at all the dimensions of a, of a human being, mind, heart, energy, body, soul, spirit, relationship with God, and relationship with that world here on the horizontal plane. And, uh, and through my journey, I developed uh, very specific uh, maps and methodologies to address all those different centers and to bring them in synergy. Because inner focusing is about bringing your mind, your heart, your energy, your soul, your body together and, and, and focusing that. Focusing that into a very purposeful action, into a very uh, responsible action, into a very loving action, heart-based action, soul-based action. And my big passion in life, uh, that's been my journey also. I consider myself for many years as a, as a freedom fighter. <laughs> decolonizing my own world and I fought for that like uh, you know and and that's what I'm trying to that's what I'm doing for other people that's really my focus to to get them to reclaim their own world their own inner world and uh, and when they've done that then to help others do the same for themselves <laughs> and I'm very passionate about this because uh, I see so much beauty in, the, in people, so much beauty. And yet I see that beauty is just left, you know, like, a, it's not, it's, it's a lost resource in so many lives. And people have, they have that magnificence and they don't know what to do, they don't even know that it's there. <laughs> and, and that really disturbs me. That really disturbs me. Tell so, I have a bad habit of speaking too much, so today I will, Come back to self-discipline and shut up. <laughs> I hope it's not been too fast because shortness of time is very stressful for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Frederick. Thank, Thank you, my dear. Thank you. You were gentle. It wasn't fast. Thank you. So next, we have Mugove um, sharing on how to patient management. Um, Mugove shares that my mission, his mission is to share his life skills, land use design skills, and passion for environment, to listen, encourage, and share with everyone, especially the children to be empowered, to look after themselves and the environment for the common good. He has played a central role in the development of integrated land use design process as a tool for whole school land design and building community resilience. So we are excited to listen from you, Mugove, on how can we make education more relevant. Uh, thank you very much, Madur, and uh, uh, greetings everyone from uh, Southern Africa. Um, I am a community development facilitator. Um, yeah, working um, in several African countries with the 
communities, but using schools as an entry point. Um, and um, when I look at uh, the relevance of education, I would like to uh, look at the aspect of why it is um, important to make education relevant. And also um, when we talk of educational relevance to whom should do education be relevant? And then we can then look at um, how um, we can uh, make education relevant. Um, I consider education to be um, one of the most important investments in life. Um, and um, it, it is um, very important because um, it not only ensures continuity and uh, intergenerational transition um, at the societal level, but it can also be um, a very important tool for social change. Um, so it should be made relevant so that it can contribute towards the achievement of um, our societal uh, goals. Um, and um, to whom should uh, education be relevant? Definitely education should be made relevant to the learner. Um, we, we know in conventional education, people talk about um, relevance to the job market, uh, which I think is a complete uh, misfire uh, because um, education should really be focused on the, on the learner uh, because learners should be empowered to be able to create value in life. Um, they should uh, be able to do so not only as individuals, but also in partnership with other people. So um, that should be uh, the, the focus of um, education. So it is, um, I think in my view, more important to uh, create um, social entrepreneurs rather than um, uh, creating job seekers as the current focus uh, seems to be. Um, learners are at the center of any education system. And so the education system must be designed um, with the learner at the center and with the learner in mind and um, education must be relevant to learners um, above everything else. Now, how can we achieve this um, educational relevance? Um, it means that um, we need to see the whole education system as being a um, learner centered. Um, it means that um, the education should meet the wholesome needs of, of the learners, all the needs of the learners. And um, it should contribute um, towards the development of the whole person, uh, the whole uh, learner uh, that, that we are focusing on. And it should prepare learners to uh, not only identify their potential, but also to develop um, uh, this uh, potential. And um, this um, uh, potential should be looked at in terms of um, the full uh, range of capacities that each learner is endowed, endowed with. And um, we should make sure that um, um, education helps to nurture uh, these capacities. And um, we, um, I know um, with my uh, background on working with nature that um, one of the fundamental laws um, in nature is that um, uh, nature takes away whatever is not used. So if we do not uh, develop all the capacities that the learners have, then those capacities become um, useless. They cannot be used. Um, just for to give an example is that um, um, if 
our muscles are not utilized. Um, they become, uh, they lose their elasticity and they become useless. So when we look at education, we should look at every aspect, including every muscle in the body must um, be utilized. Otherwise uh, it becomes um, irrelevant and useless to um, the, the learner. So we should do tailor our education to meet the diverse needs um, of individual learners. And um, also, um, we also need to look at the needs of learners as a collective, because um, uh, human beings are social beings. So it is the collectivism in, in Africa, we talk of Ubuntu. Um, I am because we are. So we need to look at the collective needs um, of, of the learners as well, apart from the um, individual needs. And we should help learners to um, celebrate their inherent uh, capacities. And um, we should look at um, the, the following characteristics in terms of um, 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 uh, relevant education or learner-centered education. Um, number one, it, it must be wholesome. Um, I think I've um, uh, explained this point already. Uh, number two, education must be fun. Um, the, the learners must enjoy being educated. And um, number three, education must be practical. Um, we already talked about um, learners having um, all sorts of muscles that need to be uh, utilized. And um, education must be experiential. Uh, we should do, make sure that um, learners use all their senses um, that they are endowed with, not just to um, warm their bosoms, just listening uh, to the so-called teachers. Um, the education must be learner-driven. Uh, so uh, learners should do, be able to make choices um, during the delivery of education. So in conclusion, um, I would like to say that um, a relevant education is the one that nurtures the personal development of the learner. It recognizes um, uh, the individual differences that are in learners and um, allows learners to dream, allows learners to work towards the future that they all want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ngobe. And uh, also a reminder for us to keep us mentally and physically fit to keep on learning. Um, next is myself. Uh, my name is Madhur. I run a center called Sehat One with my father here in India, which is a center for forest therapy. We work with different people uh, in helping them with their uh, some diagnosed illnesses like diabetes, blood pressure, lifestyle diseases, and all those sorts of things. Um, in my high school, I, uh, I was a bit disillusioned with the studies, or probably I had studied too much because in India you have to study a lot in your high school. And then I was looking, is there something else? And which got me onto a journey of Taking a gap year, I discovered Swaraj University and experiential learning, uh, doing lots of projects, traveling around the country, seeing a lot of alternatives, which inspired me that, okay, uh, maybe uh, later in my life, I would love like to live on the land, live in the forest. My father um, is a health scientist. He is a drug discovery scientist. So he was busy making new medicines and his own journey was also turning towards how can nature heal, uh, heal us. So together, five years ago, we started the center, Sehat One, uh, which was about how can we go as close to the forest as possible. And I must say, I, I, I have grown up in a city and going there was like becoming Flintstones and going to the Stone Age. And we would make our own houses and uh, solar electricity, 
for five years, we lived without plumbing, carrying our own water everywhere, and grow, trying to grow our food. Uh, and we are very fortunate to receive a lot of lot many people around the country and also from abroad to come and stay with us for weeks, work on their health. Um, so this has been my journey. Um, I want to share a story, uh, which is the story of Sweta Ketu from Upanishads, which are one of the holy books in India. Sweta Ketu was like a topper student uh, in his school, the traditional Gurukul, and he learned about everything and he was very famous. He could write very well. He knew all the knowledge. And one day his master tells him that now I've got all that there is to learn and uh, you can go back now. So he was very proud, um, very proud of the graduation. He goes back, returns to his home. His father is a big king uh, and he goes with a lot of pride uh, and his father is watching from the window, seeing his son come back and uh, he becomes sad. And the son looks at the father and he gets very surprised that I, I have succeeded. I have become this very smart, very intelligent person. Why is my father unhappy? And he goes to his father and asks and the father says that, um, have you learned what cannot be taught? Have you learned after which there is no need to learn? And um, the son becomes confused and he says, I've learned a lot of things and I can teach to whoever wants to learn, but how can you learn something which cannot be taught? So the father says, no, no, your education is incomplete. You need to go back to your master and ask him all these questions. So he goes back to his master and the master, uh, he asks him, okay, so what is... Um, how can I learn which cannot be taught? And why haven't you taught me this? And my father thinks I, my education is completely incomplete. Uh, so the master says that you never asked. You were always following me. So all that I could share, I shared with you, but you never inquired. And now if you want to inquire, it's a different journey. So the, uh, the student is, he feels ground shaking and he feels that oh what is the use of all this knowledge teach me what is the other thing and he says okay you take we have in our gurukul around 300 animals you take them go to the deepest forest and um, when they become 1000 you come back student was very sincere so he takes all the animals and he goes very deep into the forest and um, he gets hurt he figures out how to survive and um, he starts living with them. Um, day by day, he, he feels that he's carrying a lot of useless knowledge in his head. And of course, the animals don't know how great of a scholar that he has become, how many knowledges, languages he knows, and all the scriptures he knows. And he keeps on feeling that the animals don't know how great I am. And uh, there is no use for human communication. And, uh, why am I carrying all this? And slowly he starts to move like them. He forgets thinking about past and future uh, to the point that he actually forgets that he has to return when someday and the animals keep on growing, they reproduce, they become a thousand and it becomes very difficult for them to stay together. And when they complain, one day they complain to Svetaketu that you know, your master said that we have to return once we become a thousand and the time has come, we should go back. And he had completely forgotten. Uh, so he says, okay, let's go back. So he goes back to his Gurukul and his master is teaching to other disciples and he sees this big procession of animals coming in and the master becomes very excited and he says, hey, look, see, there is a thousand and one animals are coming because he sees that the Svetaketu has become one with the animals and he moves freely and he, uh, the pride he had, the egoistic nature he had is disappeared. So Svetaketu comes to him and uh, Master is joyous and he says, oh, you have, uh, I think you have got it. Uh, and there's no more need to come to me. And Svetaketu also says that, yeah, I've just come to return the animals and to, uh, just pay my respects. 
So this is a very famous story from um, the Upanishads, and I really like how it. Um, to me, it related to the title of educating for the whole being and uh, mind, body, and soul. In Hindi, we have a word called the word for healthy is swast, uh, which if you break it break it down, it swa plus tha. Swa means self and stha means situated. So swast literally translates into situated in self. So you can only be swast or healthy when you are situated in self. Um, it's, it's the most common word in Hindi. You see it on all the government hospitals and everywhere it's there. Although now it's just taken as, as that if your blood pressure is normal, then okay, you are, you are swast. Uh, but to really become situated in self, that has been the inspiration for us at Sehat One. And um, now we are, um, uh, we have also begun working on emotional health. Earlier, we were working with more diagnosed problems around um, weight and glucose and blood pressure and all these things. So we are launching, we launched a project called Mood Forest in which um, we are inviting people and participants to um, come to the forest and spend time and see how that impact impacts their uh, mental health. Uh, I'll just share something on the screen. Okay. So living in the forest, this is the mood forest model that we have uh, been following with a lot of other researchers in around the world. And what we are seeing is that this disconnect, two big shifts have happened in, uh, in the whole of humanity is that we have become a lot more indoor, like all of us are right now, and a lot of sitting. So these two, which are basically the dharma of the plant to sit and to grow, uh, but we are animals and we're supposed to move uh, but the sitting and indoor uh, work has increased a lot we have disconnected from nature which is impacting how our body and how our dna uh, works uh, and it is causing a lot of changes in our hormones and ultimately to our mood uh, and it's a cash 22 situation that if you are physically emotionally the mood is off uh, it impacts what you think and how you behave uh, so you can look at it from the psychological level or from the bodily level, but it goes, keeps going in this catch-22 kind of situation. Uh, so we find that going back uh, and spending time in the forest, engaging in green workouts, engaging in community living. And I, I know all these are a lot of things which you, you guys uh, must be experiencing, must be practicing in your own life. Um, but we are very uh, fortunate that a lot many people outside of the alternatives have been coming to us and we have been able to share this with them. Um, and uh, we are, so uh, I'm working with Professor Gitsian from University of Amsterdam, who is very excited for this. So together we are conducting uh, the series of studies on how uh, being in forest affects uh, emotional health for people. Uh, we are doing this study at our center. We are also looking for other venues, other programs where we can see the results. So you bet, uh, all of you are most welcome to collaborate with us. And we are constantly looking for more places where we can collect the evidence for this. Um, and uh, right now we are doing this green mind study, which is a 21 day study where one week we are observing people at home, uh, a week at, in the forest with different activities and a week back at home and what changes are uh, going stable. So this, I wanted to share about my current project. So yeah, thank you. Um, I couldn't, I don't know if I was moderating myself at the time, but I hope it was short enough. Uh, now, you all are welcome to uh, share any questions that you have. I can also read out questions from the chat box uh, to all the panelists.
there were some silence is perfectly all right i think we all enjoy silence um oh yeah i think maybe i can take you all off um spotlight and invite anyone who wants to ask a question to just unmute themselves right we're quite a small group but it'd be lovely to see some faces and um, I'm just going to invite everyone to join us on panel and maybe you can raise your hand and my door will call on you or you can write your questions in the chat. Maybe I, I can start Sophia. Um, yeah, a warm thank you I was I was active in the chat already thanking all the speakers and sharing my ideas. Um, but I found it very touching and inspiring of course you were. You're walking a different path, but in, in any story I share, I see some commonalities. Um, it's always wonderful. Um, now I'm speaking from someone who is very much in the system. I, uh, I'm happy, Madhu, that you work with someone from Amsterdam. I'm also normally living and working in Amsterdam. Um, and I work at a, at a rather big university. Um, I train teachers. So uh, I see hundreds of teachers every year who are, um, some have also these ideas already and others are far away from it. <laughs> um, how is, I'm, I'm actually curious also on to the to panel, um, how is your experience so far with working with uh, former education institutes? Um, how much openness did you experience or, or are you, still thinking about how to approach them. I'm, I'm, I'm just curious um, how that experience is so far with the openness and the welcoming of um, such larger education institutes. Uh, uh, thank you very much for, for the question. Uh, I, I would um, volunteer to go first. Um, yes, we, we are working with um, um, education um, institutes um, and it's really not easy to, to get into, into their circle. It, it is, uh, yeah, we find that uh, most of these institutes tend to be silos um, and they, they, they just um, um, yeah, keep on it, drumming, whatever. Beat they, they they are drumming, and um, yeah, very few are open to um, engage um, other stakeholders, other people, um, except when they themselves uh, look for um, yeah a partnership or, or um, are carrying out a particular research. That's when they reach out. But if you knock on their door. Um, usually it's very difficult to, to gain any um, access or entry into working with these large educational institutions. So it, it hasn't been easy for us uh, knocking on the doors of these institutions. Thank you very much. Can I share a quick, quick one? Yes, oh, just a very short one. Uh, it's also what I'm sharing is also from my own experience with the kind of qualification or non-qualification that I, that I have. But uh, I've tried to enter, especially when I was in Vietnam, uh, I tried to enter uh, both uh, universities and also uh, some uh, corporate organization. And every time I found exactly the same response that uh, people were appreciating what I was bringing. You know, they were enjoying the show, but there was constantly that, uh, th that response at the end, that first they were saying, no, it's not for us who are uh, teachers, etc. It's for the boss to hear that. But the boss was not in the room. <laughs> and the second one was, uh, as soon as I was gone, I knew the whole thing was going straight in the bin, except what was remaining in people's heart. That was those little seeds they had managed to swallow somehow, and that were going to grow in I don't know what way. But in terms of uh, changing the, the organization and uh, bringing different mindset. Uh, so at one point, I, I completely gave up. And I thought, OK, you don't repair an old tree. 
you can't repair the whole tree. It's all, you know, twisted, broken, it, fine. But you can plant a new seed. So I thought, forget about changing big organization, but plant little seed in two people's heart and grow people. Even if you grow 10 only in your life, at least you've grown something. <laughs> and I really believe in this, that the, the spring of the new world that we are waiting for is uh, all those little seeds doing their little thing somewhere, somewhere, somewhere. But the big structure for me, stuck, stuck, stuck. And, but that's only my experience. <laughs> But it's a beautiful question, Jaro, because it's a real question. It's a real question. I've known people who, my, my mentor in inner focusing is a consultant working at a very high le level. And I saw him going very deep into organization, doing fantastic work in leadership. But 20 years down the line, I feel uh, it's been wasted. That's, uh, that's really a very, very strong feeling I had when I watched his, uh, his development. Jaro, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Frederick. Elson, you can go next. Uh, you raised your hand. Yes, I did. Uh, I was just thinking about the uh, change, and and when you mentioned trees, of course, it's it's in the outer. I don't know the English words. My I'm Swedish, uh, uh, but the, in the in the in between that, you know, the hardwood in the middle and the outer little skin of the tree, whatever it's called, is there where life is. There's in the middle of the tree is dead. And then the, the little in between, that, that's where things happen. And I think, and also for me, trying to work from inside universities for 30 years and trying to change them. And also knowing that there are so many other alternative ways of knowing and so much wiseness that the, the universities are so ignorant of and it's been so shameful for me to sort of be in that position in that and how so much is ignored uh, yeah but i think just knowing that the dead <laughs> the, the tree in the middle is dead it's in a little outskirts where things are happening so be happy to play around there and find some fun there. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Elson. Um, Karen, you can go next. Thanks, and hi, everyone. Um, my my question is is somewhat aligned to what Frederick was just talking about. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if the panelists or anyone else in the room has, you know, any insights or um, or issues worth discussing around getting these types of programs funded. So I agree that these, you know, these programs are so necessary for the change that we want to see and need to see in the world. Um, and that, as Frederick was saying, the systems are quite stuck. Um, so I come from an academic background, um, but now I'm trying to push the boundaries of teaching these types, these uh, different types of courses. I run a nonprofit and I can design the courses I have the freedom to design the courses that I want to run, which is amazing, but trying to get them funded is another story. And so I would love to just hear anybody's insights and experiences in that regard. So that, I'm not going to speak exactly to that, Karen. I just want to share this one perspective that happened for me that shifted everything. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. So I didn't share with you guys, I'm prior active duty military, Air Force. I left my job um, to spread and do this work that I'm doing now. And I was speaking with my boss one time and I was you know, having these conversations about self-love and self-worth and she wasn't hearing it. I was like, we should teach the, the rest of the people in our organization, like this is some really good stuff. Like we could all get, be better people if we took care of ourselves, right? And she just wasn't with it. I am going to a conference in Germany to speak to all of the European leaders about self-love, self-worth, taking a set, like it's, it's happening even when you feel like it's not happening. Like when the door feels shut, there's always when you have um, conviction in your heart and in the work that you're doing, doors will open up, other uh, um, alternatives will show themselves to you. It's just how, what's another way, right? Someone in here probably will give it to you, but just being open and not closing off because it seems impossible 
when she goes to that convention, she's actually going to be in the convention and she doesn't know that I'm the speaker. When she gets there, she sees me teaching this exact thing that she wasn't hearing me to her and all of her friends and her bosses. And that's what those doors open up as uh, I think it was Frederick saying, as you plant those seeds and as you have that hope and as you stay true to the work that you're doing, doors will continue to open. I hope that lands in some way. Yeah, thanks. Right. Thank you for sharing, Lanise, and for that question, Karen. Very, very important for everybody. I'll just pick up a very quick one, but again, I'm very I'm coming from another planet in that dimension. <laughs> uh, I work 20 years fully free of charge, and uh, 16 hours a day. Uh, I was uh, I was uh, I was belonging to a spiritual organization that was providing uh, you know, a few clothes, three meals a day, and a roof over my head. But uh, at one point, I thought, forget about forget about asking anyone anything. Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> and uh, and I enjoyed that tremendously. I mean, I was trained like this. As a monk, you're trained to, to live with nothing and to, to renounce everything, just to, you have yourself and that's enough. You have yourself, life, mankind, and that's enough, and God. And, uh, and so I went into that very, very strongly, and, uh, and my years of Vietnam were extremely busy. We had very big uh, numbers of, of young people coming, and everything was free. Until I started to feel that, okay, I need to involve money you know, into my thing. And then turned into, I made myself into a coach. I don't have a training as a coach, but I had enough experience, tools, material to, to start doing it professionally. And, uh, and in terms of funding, I'm really an advocate of, uh, of, of self-funding, finding a way to, to make your thing profitable, sustainable, so you're independent. In Vietnam, I worked a lot with NGOs, and that was a constant complaint. They were coming, they say, we came here because we wanted to give, and we end up in an office making projects, making a proposal about projects we never do, and, <laughs> and report about things that have not happened. And uh, that's not the life we want. So for me, when I saw all of that, I said, okay, do it, do it, do it, and see what happens.